Hey everybody, it's your host Daisha. You are in for a treat. This is one of our Music Works episodes where we look at what people are doing in classical music today. And today you're going to meet a sort of renaissance man. His name is Hugh Sung. And、uh, I met Hugh because he actually contacted me online about interviewing me for his podcast, which is called A Musical Life. It's a very cool podcast. You should check it out. We'll put a link to his show and to that interview up on our website. He was also an inventor, a pianist, an author, a business guy, many other things. He's just a great example of the sort of classical music factotum who I think. Might inspire some new classical music people who are out there trying to make a career in classical music to to sort of craft their lives in such a way that that they can survive and also have this wonderful thing in their life. P.S. This episode is going out on a leap day, so this is your one chance for the next four years to go to iTunes and、uh, subscribe to us and rate and review us on a leap day. It's pretty exciting. You should go do it. That totally makes sense. I swear. Anyway, enjoy the episode. Yep, that's it. I'm Daisha Clay, host of the Classical Classroom, a show where experts teach me about classical music. I used to know very little about classical music, and now I'd like to think that I know slightly more than very little. What I have learned is that classical music isn't the obscure, static art form that I thought that it was. In fact, it's a dynamic force that's doing amazing things in the world right now. Welcome to a classical classroom subseries, Music Works. We'll go behind the scenes at concerts, hear amazing artist stories, and look at all the ways that classical music is working in the world today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a classical classroom music works episode with Mr. Hugh Sung.、Uh, to quote Hugh's website, he is a pianist, author, and techie. And you know what? I'm actually not going to say much more about him because he is what this whole episode is about. But <laughs> I will say that in addition to the many things that you will soon learn that Hugh does, he's the host and producer of the new podcast, A Musical Life, which yours truly was lucky enough to be interviewed for, and we'll have. Have more information about that later. Hugh, welcome to、Ooh. the classical classroom. Oh, Deja, thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited.、Uh, you know, when you interviewed me the other day, it it was the strangest thing. I thought about it. <laughs> I thought I was it was so much fun because you there's there are very few、uh, moments in a person's life. Where you get to just sit there and have somebody ask you questions about yourself, <laughs> it makes you feel like the most interesting person in the world. But, Aww, but you, but but you were, you are. Oh, oh go on, <laughs> you can come on the show. Anything, but no. I, but the other thing was that I, after I walked away from the conversation for、mm -hmm. like two days after, I kept going, oh, I should have said this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I'm going to have to interject. I think I have the distinct honor of being the first person to officially interview、yes. you for public consumption. Is that, that right? That is, that's correct. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, cool. So I, I'm, I'm very honored to have been the,、uh, the first to you do. You were、that. my first、uh, non-job interview interviewer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope it was a lot more fun than a job oh, interview. Oh, so much more fun. <laughs> oh my goodness, geeking out about Star Wars together. That was, that was awesome. No, it was great. We'll have to. We'll. I'll. I'll point、uh, people to how, <laughs> how to get to your podcast at the、Thank、end of this.、You. But, um, but first. I would like to know all about you. Speaking of interviews, Ooh,、um, it's my turn. Yeah, it's your turn <laughs> in the chair.、Um, the reason that I wanted to talk to you, the theme of this episode, is that、mm -hmm. you are a modern, working classical musician, but you、mm -hmm. have your hands in a lot of different pots. You do lots of different things, and That's、right. from what I've seen, this is pretty typical of of a modern musician. And I think you're a great example. Um, oh, and、thanks. so I, I, I want for people to be able to see what it、mm -hmm. really looks like to be a musician today in the classical music world. And so I, I think I think it's interesting to know that you you were so thoroughly steeped in classical music as a kid. You entered the Curtis well, Institute as 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 a thirteen year old. So give me a little bit of your early history. How did you get involved with classical music? 
I got involved with classical music really under duress. My mother started me playing the piano when I was three years old, and in the beginning it was fun. And then my father stepped into the picture, and <laughs> <laughs> he he, <laughs> he proceeded to uh, when he realized that when it was brought to his attention that I had some ability, some talent. He became, you know, you've heard the term tiger mom. Right? Uh-huh. Well, he was the tiger dad. <laughs> And I think tiger dads can be much more fearsome. They really bear their fangs out. Wow. <laughs> so so my, my early childhood was really thanks to my father. They, you know, he pushed me to take lessons uh, when I was eight years old. Then I started studying. Well, and when I was three, I was with my mom. A few years later, I was with the, the neighborhood piano teacher. And it was so funny. Uh, th- so my mother, her English pronunciation isn't the best. Uh-huh. So the, the gentleman's name was, as I learned many years later, his name was actually Mr. Lodge. Uh-huh. But because she couldn't pronounce the, the L's correctly, she would say Raja. So I thought it was Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I thought, wow, this is the coolest <laughs> thing. I'm working with Mr. Rogers from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. <laughs> later awesome. on, I realized his name was Lodge. Lodge, not Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then when I was eight, I, I started studying with a woman named Eleanor Sokoloff. My father had, had gone to the Curtis Institute of Music to see if there's any possibility because he heard it was a great place to learn music. And it, he wanted me to take my music more seriously. And they told him the only way I could study at Curtis was to audition. But in the meantime, perhaps I would consider studying privately with one of their faculty who was taking private students. Mm-hmm. And that was her, Eleanor Sokoloff. And believe it or not, she's 101 years old and still teaching wow. at the Curtis Institute of Music even to this day. She's amazing. That is so cool. Yeah. So for the next uh, five years, she tormented me. <laughs> <laughs> I would um, the I would come out of those lessons crying and oh boy. I mean, if I had a good lesson, my father would reward me by taking me out ice skating. That was my that was a good lesson day. But most days I didn't. So that's why I'm not a very good ice skater. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, it, it, maybe it was a good thing because three years after I started studying with her. Mm-hmm. She said, well, you should probably go for this competition. It's the Philadelphia Orchestra Greenfield Competition. It's open for students, and the winners would get to play with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Uh-huh. So not only did I do that, but she also gave me the crazy idea, why don't you write your own cadenza? I was playing the Mozart, one of the Mozart piano concertos, mm-hmm. and a cadenza is a part where the piano basically riffs by themselves. They they improvise off of the main themes that they played through the piece. Right. And so I actually, you know, said, okay, sure. I just wrote my own cadenza. And she thought it was a big deal. Other people thought it was a big deal. I didn't know what the big deal was, but I played my own cadenza in that performance, which was pretty cool. So wow. <laughs> I had my first debut as a pianist and I guess as a composer too. So it was kind of neat. That's very but cool. um yeah, and the two years after that, at the age of 13, I entered the auditions for Curtis, mm-hmm. and I got in, and to celebrate, we, not, we went out to McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> you people know how to party. We sure do. Boy, a Big Mac after winning an audition? <laughs> what could be better than that, right? <laughs> As a kid, not much at all. <laughs> I want to get to your techie side. But I want to start (laughs) with, you know, on your website, you say you're a pianist, author, and techie. Tell us about your um, pianist persona, (laughs) your your pianist resume. Well, it's interesting. When I was a young student at Curtis, I actually entered the school with a lot of skepticism. Mm -hmm. My piano teacher, Eleanor Sokolov, told me that the only way you can succeed is to have full, blind dedication. Music has to be everything. You you have to commit to it 100%, and there can't be anything else. And I just didn't buy into it. (laughs) I I, I had too many interests. You know, I loved, you know, I loved the sciences. I loved art. I was, at one point, I was actually seriously thinking about becoming an animator. Boy, wouldn't it be cool if I worked for Pixar? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, so I had all these interests in art and math and science, and music was just one of the things that I happened to do. I happened to do it well. Mm -hmm. And so I really struggled with becoming a musical monk, so to speak. I I just, I I really wrestled against that. And I think that worked to my advantage because I always kept an open mind towards 
what else could I do at the same time? Yeah. I didn't want to be stuck doing one thing. You you started out you started out wide open and interested in everything yes. around you, and this happened to be something right. that you were just very good at. You were you were essentially a born Renaissance man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Well, so uh, you know, my early training, of course, was in piano mm-hmm. solo, basically learning to play the piano by myself. Mm-hmm. But being the social butterfly that I am, I loved hanging out with my friends, and my friends would always ask me, "Oh." Would you be able to accompany me for my lesson or would you be able to play for this concert? Mm -hmm. And in classical music, we call that collaborative piano. That's the politically correct term for saying accompany. Uh (laughs) And there's – because every other instrument in the classical music field has a large body of repertoire Mm -hmm. that they need to play with another pianist. The pianist either is simulating an orchestra part for concertos or the pian their piece is specifically written for those instruments with the piano as a duo uh, duo partner. Yeah. So there were all my friends and all different instruments. If you name an instrument, I played with them it, because it was so much fun. I loved collaborating with them and it wasn't my focus. I just did it really for the fun of it. I didn't take it seriously. Mm-hmm. A lot of chamber music, a lot of accompanying. And lo and behold, uh, one day I get this call. I, I went into this lesson with one of my violinist friends for the violin professor. His name was Aaron Rosand. Mm-hmm. He is known today as one of the last great romantic violinists. And he was terrifying. Oh, my goodness. He was he was a cigar-chomping professor, and he would yell and <laughs> scream and tell you, oh, you can't play. What are you doing? He would just tear the students to shreds. And I was shaking in my in my in my feet just going to the lessons with my friends, seeing them being torn apart before my eyes it was such a act of musical carnage. But <laughs> anyway, he was a he was he was a terrifying man. And then guess what? Hmm. One day, I get a phone call from Aaron <gasps> Roseanne, I... and he says, "Would you be interested in going on a tour of Japan and Korea with me?" What? I I I think my jaw hit the ground wow. and kind of rolled a couple blocks away. I could not believe it. But apparently he had been so impressed with the way that I accompanied his students, Mm -hmm. he thought, hey, I think we found a new partner. And that started a 20-year collaboration. And in many ways, thanks to him, Mm -hmm. I broke out quite early into the professional scene, Mm -hmm. not the way that I expected, but as a collaborative pianist. Interesting. So, yeah. And and now you and now you have collaborated with people like composer Jennifer Higdon, with um, mm-hmm. violinist Hilary Hahn. I mean, yep. like you've you've kind of uh, the interesting thing about collaborative piano is the fact that you have to be much more sensitive, and you're exposed to many more styles of playing. Mm-hmm. You learn to mimic the style of the person you're working with. One person may be very straightforward. Aaron Roseanne was the kind of player that he would never play the same thing twice. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you're coming across such a wide spectrum of not only personalities, but also instrumental styles, you know, a flute player approaches a, f- a phrase a different way than a violinist yeah. does, which is different than a trumpet player or an accordion yeah. player <laughs> or a saxophone player. You know, it, the, you start to develop a very colorful palette mm-hmm. to match their sounds. And so that's only helped me to expand my musical imagination back to my own solo piano playing. Yeah. And so being a collaborative pianist not only expanded me musically and artistically, but also professionally, because this is the world of business. And, and yeah. the, the, one of the primary facets of business is networking. Mm-hmm. The more people you know, simply the more opportunities come your way. And that's quite simply what happened. The more I played with other people, the more they wanted to work with me. They, you know, I, Most of my work really comes from word of mouth. I didn't have to advertise per se. I just got known in the field. And when they wanted the quote unquote <laughs> best pianist to work with, who was Johnny on the spot, <clears throat> who could learn music fast and could make them sound good, I was the person, I was kind of the go-to pianist for those situations. Well, I think you've, you've now said two things that are probably considered an- anathema uh, <laughs> in the music world. One was that you did not 
ever want to become a musical monk. You didn't want to be an artiste. You had、yes. broad interests.、Um, mm -hmm. You wanted from the very beginning to to do many kinds of things. And and、mm -hmm. now the other is that you've said that it's a business, and、mm -hmm. you take a you seem to take a very practical approach to it, which is interesting. Well, you know when I when I graduated from Curtis, when I was about to graduate, my very very last piano lesson with my professor at the time, and going up to my teacher and saying, "Okay, I've been at Curtis for eight years." And I'm getting ready to go into the world, and I want to make a career. Now what? What do I do? How do I get started?、Uh -huh. And I'll never forget. He kind of looked at me sheepishly, shrugged his shoulders, and said, "I don't know." <laughs> oh, man. I remember thinking, "You're kidding me." <gasps> I, I, I was probably thinking stronger language than that, but you are kidding me. All this time and energy I've invested in this field, and you have no clue how to get started. Wow. And, and so. I almost immediately started thinking about okay, well, what's what's my backup plan? And I started taking classes in accounting. I started taking classes in painting.、Mm -hmm. You know, it, the reality was as much as I love music, I don't want to be a starving artist.、Mm -hmm. I don't want you know, I don't want to suffer for my music. And so I was very willing to jump into other fields if necessary.、Mm -hmm. And it just so happened, music pulled me back in. My network of friends got me. Very, very busy, very quickly. Again, with collaborative work, with teaching, and with other areas. And so, even though I had an eye towards the backup plan, so to speak,、um, music won out. But I was always ready to to change directions on a dime if necessary. Now,、yeah. even though I had a, a pragmatic view in terms of wanting to make a living、mm -hmm. and being able to make enough to make a living. There's nothing better than making music. It is the most wonderful thing to do something where you feel as if you can express yourself fully、yeah. and share a deep connection with other people. And the way that you can move them—I mean, when you play a concert and you see tears in people's eyes—that's something very, very special.、Yeah. And, and so, there's two sides of this coin.、Yeah. Number one, as a musician. I wanted to be practical and and make a, a, a livable wage, but as a business person, on the flip side, there are not many businesses that have the heart to want to move people and that really want to connect、yeah. with people on the same level that an artist does. Yes,、yeah. so I think the best of both worlds is something that Steve Jobs really is one of those iconic people that, as Walter Isaacson said in his biography, Steve Jobs was really. At the crossroads of art and technology, the best where he made technology beautiful and he made art practical,、mm. and so I, I, that's something that I found. Of course, you know, I didn't know Steve Jobs at the time, but I think I had a similar mindset. Where wouldn't it be great if business could have the heart of an artist、yeah. and art could have the pragmatic view? Of business, so I've always tried to pursue all of my pursuits with both of those goals in mind. Whatever business pursuits I do, I want to pursue them with an artist's heart and desire for mastery and connection,、mm -hmm. and in, and in with art, trying to find ways to maximize my output and effectiveness. You know, I think that thing that your professor said to you, where he just sort of, you know, you, you get to you get to the end of this this long stint where you've、yeah. put in hours and hours of work. Your whole life has、mm -hmm. been, you know, eight years of your life has been consumed by you know learning music and performing music,、mm -hmm. and and then all of a sudden you have someone telling you. I have no、uh, bleep bleep clue that that is a a pretty new、right. issue.、Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? And do you agree or disagree? I don't think it's a new issue. I think it's an issue that musicians have struggled with as for as long as musicians have been musicians. I think it's human、uh -huh. nature to want security and safety and a clear path. In other fields, that's much more defined than perhaps in music. You know, for orchestral musicians, violinists, you know, cellists, they have the orchestral、yeah. route, which is 
a lot more available, but not really for pianists. For pianists, we're really left on our own. There's there are pianists in the orchestra, but they're not. They're just not utilized to the same degree that that the strings are, for example, or the brass instruments. You know, so for pianists, it's always been a very strange and more an amorphous struggle to figure out how to make it work. Now, um, the most successful musicians have had the benefits in the past of patrons, of sponsors, of managers that swoop in at an early age and basically coddle and take care of you. Well, that's fine and dandy, but in today's age, they're just number 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 one. There are not that many managers around that are as effective, and number two, the you know the world is changing, and uh, as we're seeing with with a lot of record labels and even managements, it's really up to the artists themselves to learn to promote. You know, so this is a new era, and and the the challenging thing is that our art is so consuming in terms of the time required to master the craft that. It's it's hard to remember that you need to think beyond that, that your music can be all-consuming, but you can't let it. You have to remember to live a life and, and be a human being beyond your music. And you, you have to always remember your music needs to express who you are as a person, not to be you in and of itself. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and speaking of your person, you also – on your website, mm-hmm. talk about how you're an author and a techie. So let's talk a little bit about what you have done as an author and what you do as a techie. Well, the author part came after being the techie. So let me back up a bit. When I left, when I graduated Curtis a few years later, they actually asked me to come back and help them out with their accompanying program. And so I came back and I was accompanying. And before long, I took over the the whole department. So I was in charge of the company at Curtis, and then my uh, the person who was in charge of the concert division, running the hundred plus recitals at Curtis, the student recitals, he became ill and actually passed away. And then the school approached me again and asked, "Would I be interested in taking that on as well?" Mm-hmm. This was a crazy job. My my friend used to spend two weeks at the end of the year collating all these paper request forms and typing out a six-page report outlining all the pieces that had been played in alphabetical order. It took him two weeks to type out six pages on an electric typewriter. And so I I looked at this job and said, this is impossible for one person. There's no way I could do it with a typewriter. So I was one of the first people at Curtis to bring my own personal PC, a personal computer to work. <laughs> wow. And so I started thinking, hmm, I wonder if there might be a way to automate this instead of typing in Beethoven's birth and death dates every single time by hand, instead of uh-huh. typing out all the movement headings of a piece and, and doing that, you know, ma- manually. Couldn't there be a way of automating this? And this is when I learned to create a database my first relational database. Uh-huh. So the student recital series up to that point, the director of student recitals, every year at the beginning of the year, he'd have this long speech to the students telling them, please, please sign up for the concert series. Because sometimes they'd have <laughs> days where there was nobody signed up and they'd be scouring the halls trying to snag students in <laughs> to sign up for empty spots. Uh-huh. The, the year that I computerized the entire system we have recitals that run from October to May. By November of that year, the entire series was booked. There were no empty dates because wow. the database automated all of that. It showed exactly how much time was remaining, how long each piece was, which recitals were closed, which were open. It was a very easy searchable system. Mm-hmm. And basically, I let everybody else choose instead of me being in charge of choosing. That's that's how information systems work best when you work on the hive or the cloud mentality. Yeah, so anyway, yeah. um, the entire series was was closed in November. The whole school went into a panic. The administration thought, oh, well, the teachers must be doing a better job of teaching this year. And <laughs> nobody <laughs> recognized that this simple little database had basically transformed the entire life of the school. Wow. So when it was my turn to give the speech for the very first time the next year, my story was, Guys, if you don't sign up for a concert now, you ain't getting a spot. So better you better <laughs> hurry. So That's great. W- when I saw that, mm-hmm. what that told me was the incredible transformative power of information and technology. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking, wow, if I could change the entire school's performance 
system with one little program. Mm -hmm. What if I could do something like that, but for sheet music? I mean, one of the things as an accompanist, I always struggled with because I would be playing so many pieces, learning repertoire every day, running to the library every day and carrying you know, dozens of books on my duffel bag and I'd have this mountain of books that would just, you know, losing music, forgetting music. I'm an incredibly forgetful person. I, I, I remember one time driving out to a, somebody's audition for an important management in New York City. Halfway up the New Jersey Turnpike, about an hour into the drive, I realized I forgot the music. I left oh, the book no. at home. Ah, oh, I called my friend and I said, I am so sorry. I, I basically ruined his audition. For oh, a no. stupid piece of music, a oh, no. piece of paper, you know, stuck in, you know, in my, in my home. <laughs> so I thought there's got to be a better way that technology can solve this. Yeah. And right, on, right around 2001, Microsoft came out with the first tablet PC. <laughs> and so I thought this is the answer to my dreams. And I started scanning music and putting it into my computer, and it looked fantastic. I could even use – they even had pens back then where you could draw – on the screen and ink would come out and it was it was fantastic 2001 wow, that's awesome. now the only problem was how do you turn the page mm -hmm. and i started searching around i thought it'd be silly for me to use a button or a mouse and have me flipping my hand every page to turn the page you know flipping my hand on the on the keyboard or something so mm -hmm. i started looking around for foot switches and there were nobody was making foot switches that could do the job uh, in, in the, what, the way I wanted it to. Number one, they all clicked. They made loud noises. Yeah. Noises. They were all. They all had USB cables, and they were all complicated to program. So what I wanted, my dream was to come up with a silent, simple, and sleek wireless page turning pedal. Mm -hmm. And in 2008, my dream came true. I partnered up with somebody, and it's again, it's one of those classic cases of a need. Creating a you know, creating yeah. a business out of a, a desperate need, and so I became really the, I was probably one of the very first professional musicians to you to become a paperless pianist. That's what I called myself, a paperless pianist. And people thought I was weird and nuts and crazy. <laughs> and then, of course, the iPad came around, and everybody said, "Oh, what a great idea!" <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> and you're rolling your eyes. Well, and, back well it, in you know, hand. it started. In, we, our business started two years. This is a company called Airturn. Mm -hmm. co-founded co in 2008 and we launched just as the recession hit <laughs> and everything was tanking and I thought this is the worst idea ever and then when the iPad came around it just turned the company around like crazy and now Airturn is selling products all over the world it's, it was pretty amazing For the, for the sake of, of time, can you just give me a quick bullet list of what you do in, in, in a given week? Like how, <laughs> how many different things are you doing? Just, just uh, what, what's your to-do list look like? Oh, well, let's see. Today, I, lo I officially launched my podcast, even though I had been, I have actually been preparing this podcast for about two, two, three months now. But um, the podcast is called A Musical Life. Mm -hmm. And it features interviews with famous celebrities like Daisha Clay. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of <laughs> and, and some of my other musician friends. Um, so right now, my, a, a big part of my focus is getting this show off the ground and scheduling interviews. And, and I do all the editing myself. So editing, marketing, publishing, producing. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of work right there. But it's so much fun. I really enjoy it. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, a week or so ago, I was, at the Baltimore, I was with the Baltimore Symphony, subbing with them, playing some Philip Glass, Icarus mm -hmm. at the Edge of Time. That was really fun. Uh, mm -hmm. The Philadelphia Orchestra will call me every once in a while to help out with auditions or do some other work uh, on the back end. And I have a couple of recitals still booked by friends. They, they give me a call. In fact, I'm talking, I was just speaking with a friend of mine who is planning a tour of Asia. We're going to be going to Japan, Korea, and China. She's a flute player. Her name is Jasmine Choi, fantastic flute player. Um, and I've got another flutist I'm going to be performing with in New York City. So my schedule really is a, a hodgepodge of a lot of things. I spend a lot of time mm -hmm. marketing which means just engaging in social media, um, answering emails, but also um, 
I teach online. I teach an online school called Artist Works, and mm-hmm. I teach about 160 students at this point around the world. We use a, what's called a video exchange learning system, where the students post videos onto the site whenever they want. And then when I, whenever I have time, I go on to the site and I post videos to respond to their videos. So they get personalized interactions oh, with that's me. that's cool. It's a really neat system. And for me, I, I love teaching that way because I don't have to schedule the time directly with the students. Uh, you know, can you imagine trying to teach somebody in Australia or China? <laughs> it's a 12-hour difference. Right. Yeah. This sort of solves that problem. Yeah. That's well, I mean, I think this has been just a, a fascinating look into what a modern musician's life looks like. I mean, while I was thinking about this interview and I was I was kind of coming up with some questions that I wanted to ask you, mm-hmm. it occurred to me that, you know, my initial take on this was that this is such a modern um, issue that, 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 you know, in the age of technology, in the age of orchestras having less money, mm-hmm. classical stations going by the wayside, yeah. These kinds of things uh, that that musicians are being sort of forced to become th- to adapt and and to do other things. But then it occurred to me that this is actually a very old concept. Mm-hmm. That there have been Renaissance people in classical music for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, and and I'm wondering if uh, as a final question, if you can give us some examples of those kinds of people who maybe you've drawn inspiration from. It's interesting. Um, Muzio Clementi. Clementi is a n- really well known for piano students. They they play a lot of his sonatinas. And he's got a lot of you know, ba- you know, beginner and intermediate pieces that are stand, you know, standards for piano teachers and piano students. What mm-hmm. not a lot of people know that he was also a very successful piano salesman. And he really made his fortune doing that. Yeah. And so that's an example of a man. So maybe he wasn't as famous as, uh, as Beethoven. But, you know, he really knew how to earn, a, make a comfortable living and he didn't have to suffer for his art. And he yeah. used to, he, he was, you know, a pianist of the, of the highest order. He was a great composer, but he was also an entrepreneur who knew how, who understood business and had a really, really decent life. You know, so yeah. I think, you know, I mean, he may not be standing on the shoulders of Mozart or Haydn or Beethoven like that. But you know what? He's what he's known the world over. He's famous for his mm-hmm. little pieces. And he didn't have to have to suffer quite as much for it. Hey, so, we did a classical classroom about him. So he's got to go. be somebody. <laughs> there you go. So that's an example of somebody who I think took a very yeah. pragmatic, practical approach and yet still enjoyed the benefits of both business and art. That's a great example, Hugh. Oh. And, and um I, I don't know. Like I, I, I'm, I'm really fascinated at the way that people put their lives together, how their careers look, where they get, where they take care of the practical aspects of their lives, while, while continuing to get to do the work of an artist. So I, I'm, I appreciate you kind of giving, giving me a little glimpse into how you do it. I think today, thanks to technology. There's never been a better time to be a musician. I know we hear a lot of people saying, oh, classical music's dying. Musicians are, you know, it's harder than ever for a musician to make a living. But I actually think the opposite to be true. There have been never been more opportunities for folks who are willing to take the initiative and who are willing to become students for life, willing to realize that your music doesn't simply end from graduating from music school or playing a concert or winning a competition. It's, that's really just the beginning. And so if you're open to learning and trying new things and adapting to the new technologies we have around us, really, there is no greater opportunity to create a terrific life for yourself. I could not have said it better, Hugh. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show. It's been great to talk to you, uh, especially from the other side of the microphone this time. Oh, thank you so much for having me on the show and letting me uh, get the opportunity to share some of these things. All right, everybody, that does it for this Classical Classroom Music Works episode. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. Follow us on Twitter and Tumblr and YouTube. Subscribe to us and rate us and review us on iTunes. And thank you. Um, email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. 
Thanks today to audio producer Todd Mine Like a Steel Trap Holslander for making us sound good. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for the mystery of him. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing tiger beat eyes. Thanks to Hugh Sung for being here today. Thanks to me for saying words. And most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>